Uh, with us here now in the studio is a gentleman who has uh, certainly become famous. Uh, I hate to say, in, in the words of uh, a lot of people in the management of baseball, infamous, but nevertheless handles uh, the likes of uh, Johnny Bench, Pete Rose, Tony Perez. And please understand, as people out there, uh, because of the delicate nature of negotiations nowadays for the mega bucks that a lot of people uh, are making, uh, we are not going to take phone calls. We're going to, uh, I'm going to talk to Reuben here for a while, Mr. Reuben Katz. And we don't want to talk about Johnny Bench and Pete Rose. Uh, contracts in general, yes. The situation of, uh, as the pendulum has apparently swung, the power now in professional baseball is to the players, and if you'll pardon the expression, the agents and their clients. And uh, the talk uh, this week about Fernando Valenzuela, how in the world can he ask for uh, now $800,000 a year when he just played for his second year for the Los Angeles Dodgers, and what if he falls on his face? Uh, Mr. Katz, sir, first of all, welcome to our program, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, how did you, let's back up, uh, let's go back to day one. How did you originally get involved as a player agent or as a player representative, a sports lawyer for, I believe your first client was Pete Rose? Right. Uh Back in the 60s, um, a friend of mine, High Owner, asked me if I would represent Pete. Uh, having been a sports nut and particularly a baseball nut all my life, uh, I thought that would be a, a very, very interesting thing to do, and I agreed to do it. Then uh, how and when did you take on well, Tony Pete, Perez and uh Pete Johnny introduced Bench. me to uh, Johnny Bench, and I started representing him, and uh, and then also Tony Perez. Mm -hmm. The three of them were very close. And all three on the Reds. That made it convenient all right here yes, in town. Exactly. Did you have intentions when you uh, began your law practice, Reuben, of uh, becoming a sports lawyer? No. It's... Um, I guess when I began my uh, law practice, uh, there was no such thing as a sports lawyer. Uh, Sports law was uh, for people who represented teams. In, in fact, when you took on Pete Rose, uh, there wasn't really a, a, a business of sports lawyering then, was there? It was beginning. Uh, in 1968 or 69, I attended the first seminar given by the Practicing Law Institute for representing professional athletes. And it, um, it was just beginning to become a field that lawyers could uh, be involved in. Have any idea, do you remember how many people might have been involved in that initial symposium? I think there were, as I recall, the room was a small room in a hotel in New York. I think there were about 20 or 25 of us. That's all. That's and, you had, and you had already taken on Pete? I was I was already representing Pete, uh, Johnny, and Tony. I see. Now it is 1982. There are literally hundreds of uh, sports lawyers, or I should say, there may be uh, different classifications, but agents and sports lawyers. There is a difference. Well, I, there is a difference. Uh, a sports lawyer has, if you uh, to to have that title, you have to be a practicing lawyer. Anyone can be an agent of a baseball player. And I guess uh, there's a difference in trying to uh, uh, state what role you're playing on behalf of the athlete you represent. Mm -hmm. uh, being a sports lawyer, do you have an opinion that might uh, uh, be along the same lines as a lot of people in management of professional sports, that uh, there are a lot of agents out there who have no particular qualifications other than the fact that they have an American Express credit card and uh, go around the country and try to sign up players? Are, are you upset sure. with some of the things that happen to professional athletes? Well, first of all, let me say I, I'm upset uh, that there are a lot of terrible sports broadcasters and there are a lot of incompetent uh, uh, lawyers, there are a lot of incompetent uh, accountants, uh, a lot of incompetent doctors. Uh, there are not, everyone isn't wonderful in every field. Sure, I'm upset by some of the things that I see happen in sports by people representing athletes. I'm also upset sometimes by some of the things management does. So uh, uh, it's uh, and it's it's a problem. Yeah. 
Whenever there is an agent or a sports lawyer who sits down with a member of management in professional sports, it is obviously labor versus management. Is it always as uh, cutthroat and as uh, and as uh, warlike as it's portrayed in the press? Oh, it's I mean, here in Cincinnati, uh, there have been some agents who have been paid in as uh, less than admirable people, but yet in Philadelphia. I don't hear your name spit out the way it has in the past been spit out here in Cincinnati. Uh, when when uh, Pete Rose and I visited uh, quite a few uh, major league offices, and before that when I discussed Pete's free agency with a lot of owners of baseball teams and general managers, uh, we all had very friendly conversations. Uh, I, I think most of the uh, negotiations I've had, the negotiations I've had with the, with Montreal and Boston Red Sox on behalf of uh, of uh, Tony Perez, have been uh, very friendly. Uh, no different than if I were to be negotiating uh, a deal for a, a businessman mm -hmm. with another businessman mm -hmm. it uh, it can be friendly and business like uh, uh, or it can be mean and ugly mm -hmm. uh, is there any way that you can uh, that you can tell going in which is going to be as you say very business like and which is going to be mean and ugly well after uh, are there indications well after all a while you you get to know certain personalities involved and and you get a pretty good idea but uh... not necessarily you could have a very happy deal with uh, someone one day and an unhappy one with them the next day you you would hope that at all times you're negotiating on a business on a business like level for mm -hmm. the good of all parties involved because so it's, it's not always as distasteful as it may appear in the press or in the media. Uh, there are times when you sit down and it's a very constructive meeting. Well, sometimes it's a lot of fun, too. Uh, it, it's no secret that uh, a couple weeks ago I went down to Clearwater and I visited with Bill Giles, who is the uh, general partner uh, and one of the owners, and the man who runs the Philadelphia Phils. Mm -hmm. uh, I stayed in Bill's apartment uh, with him down there. We played tennis. We went to the dog track. We ate uh, meals together, and uh, uh, during the 48 hours when we were together constantly, uh, we had a nice time, and we talked about Pete Rose. And in other situations, it's not quite done that way. In other situations, it's not very friendly. Uh, may I venture to say that the situation that might not be so friendly would be the Cincinnati Reds? Or sometimes. Sometimes? Sometimes. Well, how has this business grown into a multi-million dollar uh, industry where now, uh, I believe next week there is a symposium in Florida uh, for sports lawyers that may draw hundreds of lawyers and agents and representatives as opposed to uh, 20, uh, 12 or 13 years ago? I mean, is it that lucrative a business? No, not really. Uh, it may be for some people. There are um, many people who represent players who take a percentage of uh, what the player earns. Uh, I know a few years ago I was interested in finding someone, uh, some organization or some person to represent Johnny Bench in principally in his uh, commercial activities outside of baseball. And I had long conversations with the Mark McCormick company up in uh, Cleveland. Yeah. What is that called? International Management Corporation well, or something? They have several companies, but uh, International Management was an, was the name. At that time, uh, they really wanted to represent Johnny, uh, and f and what they wanted was 25 percent of everything he earned on the field, off the field, and uh, you can get pretty rich on some of the current contracts with, with a uh, percentage like mm -hmm. that. Other people represent uh, players the way they represent uh, broadcasters and and doctors, uh, and, and, doctors and, and businessmen. And, uh, on an hourly basis. Uh, on an hourly basis um, so that... Now, see, I, I have raised this question a few times about what happens in a negotiation when a player 
is represented by someone who takes a percentage. And I've used the example that during Pete's free agency period, he had a, uh, a, a proposal that I think was uh, probably valued at about a million and a half a year. The proposal from the Philadelphia Phils, the final contract, was about 800000 a year. And now suppose that the person representing Pete was getting 10% of what Pete obtained on that contract. 10% of, and say it's a three-year contract. Mm -hmm. Well, 10% of three times a million and a half, which is four and a half million, is $450,000. Does he get it 10 immediately? 10% of 240, of 2,400,000 is, is uh, $210,000 less. So it's in the representatives to his benefit to take the higher dollar. But if you're really looking out for the interests of your client, you find out what he really wants. And Pete really wanted to play with Philadelphia if he couldn't play with Cincinnati. And so that's what we worked for. And I would hope that whether I was on a percentage or not, which I'm not, uh, that I would be always looking out for the interests of the client and not uh, for my own interests. And you see where there could be a conflict of interest. The reason I wanted to talk to you tonight, Ruben, is it appears to me, let, let me spill my guts here to you for a, a little bit. Um, I spoke to the Rotary uh, Club yesterday, a uh, downtown group of about 250 or 300 men, and I spilled my guts there too. I said that uh, there was a little bit of reverie there for me because uh, in 1968 I was introduced as a member of the Cincinnati Bengals in that same room with Paul Brown there, and I was starry-eyed, I was naive. And I knew the, sets, the set of rules and regulations under which I could play professional football. And the people that signed my contract, that were my employers, they told me, if you don't like those rules, get out. Get out now. We don't want to invest time, effort, and money in you. And you just go your own way. It appears to me now, in professional baseball, uh, probably more than professional football, and certainly professional basketball is up there too, that players nowadays make so much money that players nowadays sign guaranteed long-term contracts, that players now have so many advisors, uh, sports lawyers, agents, tax men, uh, investment advisors, that they are pretty much, in general, pretty much isolated from the rest of the world, that they no longer need the press. They no longer have to look at the fans and say, those are the people that pay the money uh, that I am cashing, the checks that I'm cashing every weekend that it appears to me that this money that is going around in professional baseball is one, certainly offending the people who used to support professional baseball just uh, like crazy, the blue collar worker. How can you go down and see a million dollar year baseball player drop a fly ball or something of that nature? But two, the pendulum of power has obviously swung to the baseball player. Now I'm not saying any of your clients fall in that category, but do you not see all of a sudden some very, very callous people being signed to some unbelievable contracts that are going to make them more callous and less responsive to the uh, paying public and to management and to your advice if you're uh, this uh, particular person's uh, lawyer. And r literally, because of the money he makes and the guarantees he has over the next few years, living a life of his own, he might as well be his own grand poobah on his own island. It's got to be a tremendous problem for those of us outside of this situation observing professional baseball players. Now, what was your question? I don't have that a question. That was about a four-minute speech. I didn't say I had sure. a question. Oh, you I just made I a statement. And I, okay. I you made a statement, and, I, and you want me to comment. Tell me if well, I'm right or wrong. or I think you're wrong. Um, I, th I don't believe that the players are as isolated... Uh, or or care as little as you indicate they might. I know that um, that uh, Pete and Johnny and Tony particularly, and those are the ones I know the best. I know that they uh, they do a lot of things and they're very aware of what goes on. Uh, they are all oriented toward cooperating with the press, uh, cooperating with the fans. Uh, 
doing the things that they um, that they know they're ex that they're expected to do and that the fans are in entitled to. They're concerned about the fans. But your clients, Reuben, I must admit, are the exceptions. I'm not sure they are the exception. Uh, I hope they're not. But but I was down in Clearwater uh, two weeks ago, as I mentioned, and and it was fun. I I went out to. Um, to the Phil's workout, and there were the pitchers and the catchers were there, and there were seasoned veterans and rookies, and and the fans were there, and they and the fans were starry-eyed, being so close to these players, whether they were rookies, they were asking for autographs of groundskeepers and anyone who had an official capacity, and the players responded, and you could see those guys were working, and they knew they had to be there. Some of the superstars were there early, working out before they had to. But did that group that uh, was so responsive to the paying public, did that include Steve Carlton? I probably think not. I didn't see Steve when I when I was there. I don't know whether it was or not. But Steve would have been that way, I believe, 10 years ago or 15 years ago. There were people who didn't love the fans a long time ago. But wouldn't you admit that making a uh, million dollars, $1.5 million a year, that maybe as opposed to being responsive to the paying public that you've got to almost be a saint in their eyes and bend over backwards without those people they don't have any money that's the response we get from an awful lot of people on our program here i don't understand what you just well, said well uh, <laughs> that that since 1976 i think more uh, players salaries and the amount of specific dollars that they make are weekly broadcast published Kay. all over the place bob I, I, I haven't um, heard of any player who's called a press conference and said, now there may have been some of these, and said, hey, fellows of the press, come, I want to tell you about all the money I'm going to make. Um, this information comes out, the clubs, the clubs will have press conferences to announce the signing of a player, and sooner or later the information will leak out, and it will leak out because members of the press uh, know people who have access to these figures and the, the figures are, are uh, printed. I, I don't think the players are as interested in talking about the dollars involved as everyone makes them out to be. I think the great thing for baseball would be if the press would start concentrating on the rookies, uh, the fun of baseball, uh, who's going to be playing where, what the lineup is going to be, and stop talking about all the South. Never going to happen. Well, why? Then it's because maybe the fans, obviously you people think that the fans want to hear about all these dollars. Yeah, I would think that my response to your question why would be that for the first hundred years of baseball, nobody knew what anybody made. And now for the last six years, everybody knows what everybody makes. Sure. And the press is uh, very, very impressed with the figures. I mean, uh, when you and I, when you were growing up, a uh, million dollars meant that you were you owned a country or you were a, right. an Arabian sheikh. Right. And uh, now you might possibly be a second-string baseball player at a million dollars a year. That's stretching a little bit, but let's say a okay. a uh, an unqualified superstar in the sport. I think there is a great deal more interest in how much people make today. Well, that, that's then, why the press then and the that's media fine. Do it. Then, then we have two things to have fun with. We have the fun with the sport itself, and we have fun talking about the salaries. But that's no fun, because at a, million, at, a, at a million dollars a year, I believe uh, the people out there in their shirt sleeves drinking a a beer demand more out of a million dollar player. If yesterday he was a fifty thousand dollar a year player, well, there are a lot of million dollar players who play like a million dollars and. There are a lot of uh, those uh, who don't, and and I don't think that the dollars make that much difference. Not to the player. Uh, to the pl I don't think to the player. The guy who is going to put out and play a hundred percent, or even that one fellow who's supposed to go a hundred and ten percent, they're going to do it, regardless of the money. And there may be some who uh, take it easy because they don't have the dollar incentive. But I still think that when the chips are down, those guys are out there playing hard. And, uh, and, and I really like to concentrate on watching them play. And I, I don't care what they make. As a fan, I don't care. And I, 
I see almost every game, every home game, the Reds play. I know that. Ruben Katz is our guest. He is a well-known sports attorney. Program of Sports Talk on WLW will continue after this. We'll break for the 7 o'clock NBC News. Be back with Ruben Katz, noted sports attorney. Handles Pete Rose, Johnny Bench, and Tony Perez in professional baseball. And I'll continue my conversation with him. A conversation with him. Please, no phone calls until uh, Ruben leaves because we don't want people asking about Johnny Bench and Pete Rose's contracts. All right. Up next, the NBC News. Back in five minutes and 30 seconds. 50,000 watt clear channel voice of the Cincinnati Reds. Now at our 60th year of service, this is WLW Cincinnati. NBC News. I'm Dan Blackburn. John Belushi, the actor-comedian who soared to fame and fortune as one of the original cast members of NBC's Saturday Night Live, is dead. He was 33 years old. Police say that a rescue ambulance was summoned to a Hollywood hotel frequented by Belushi with a report that the heavyweight comic was choking. Bruce Becker, a gardener at the hotel, was one of the people who discovered the body. His body was in the master bedroom, the back bedroom, in the, the, in the bed, no, in the bed, laying in the bed. Was he... He was on his back. Clothed? Clothed, unclothed? Unclothed. Uh, apparently he had been asleep or, he was, or in he bed was, at least when he died. He was sleeping. Becker said that efforts were made, mostly mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, to revive Belushi, but to no avail. A Los Angeles police spokesman says that initial indications are that Belushi had been dead for about two hours when he was found, and that it appears he died of natural causes, perhaps a heart attack. Belushi starred in such movies as The Blues Brothers, Animal House, and most recently, The Neighbors, with his frequent Saturday Night, Saturday Night Live cohort, Dan Aykroyd. He was born in Chicago and was a member of the highly acclaimed Second City Improvisational Group in that city. He is survived by his wife, Judy. Belushi's sudden death shocked and stunned his friends and the entertainment industry. This is Dan Blackburn in Los Angeles. Steve Porter will have more news in a minute. Hello, post office. Got a question on your new two-pound pack from Express Mail Next Day Service. You'll deliver two pounds overnight anywhere you go for 9.35, less than most other people charge for just a few ounces. You wouldn't kid a veteran, would you? Express Mail Service delivers 60,000 packages on time every day, and our two-pound pack is just nine thirty-five. Ha <laughs> you son of a gun. The Express Mail two-pound pack. It lets you send more for less. Sponsored by your postal service. It's Sears Work Clothes Week. And now until March 13th, count on Sears for savings on a great assortment of durable, dependable work clothing. Save 35% on Sears Best Work Pants. Cut for comfort, permapress, and tough enough to take it. Or save 35% on Sears Permapress plaid work shirts. Long or short sleeves in a variety of colors. At most Sears retail stores. For hardworking values, you can count on Sears. The number of unemployed Americans rose to a post-depression record of 9.6 million last month, but the White House says it sees relatively encouraging signs that the recession may be nearing an end. The rise to an 8.8% level in unemployment amounts to a return to that same level after a three-tenths of a percent decline in January. Treasury Secretary Regan sees that not as a rise, but a leveling off. What I'm encouraged by is, is that it has flattened out. Uh, I think that if the... Uh if this can continue now over the next couple of months, it's a definite indication that the worst of the recession will be behind us. Reagan has been saying all along he thinks the beginning of the end of the recession will occur later this month. The nation's basic money supply dropped $3 billion in the latest reporting week in figures revealed by the Federal Reserve today. And analysts say it's apparent that upward pressure on interest rates has just about evaporated. On Wall Street today, the Dow Jones Industrial Average lost a fraction. This is NBC News. At Ford Motor Company, quality is job one. There's a spirit at Ford that's really shining through. It's people taking pride in the work they do. From the littlest detail to the grand design. We know at Ford, our future's on the line. On our line. Job one is to make the very best car we can. The best quality for our consumers. 
So we are upgrading everything that we manufacture in this plant. Customers want a good car, and we want to give it to them. And this dedication is already paying off. Overall, a 48% improvement in quality since 1980, as reported by new car owners. At Ford Motor Company, quality is job one. Better and better, see what we've done. At Ford, quality is job one. There's a holdout in a bank in Davis, California, and NBC's Rick Davis reports a number of hostages are involved. About 15 to 20 Bank of California employees are directly under the shotgun of a man identified as 29-year-old Eric Roberts. About 25 bank customers were released by Roberts. At least 20 other bank employees on other floor are unable to get out of the building. The area around the bank is cordoned off in every direction for a block. Roberts is said to have a history of mental problems. It's believed he bought a shotgun this morning at a sporting goods store, then walked to the bank and has been inside ever since, refusing to say what he wants, refusing to talk to the police at all. Rick Davis, NBC News, Davis, California. Scientists say the Mount St. Helens volcano is active in a pattern they've not seen before, and they don't know what to make of it. But they also say they don't think there's a danger of imminent e eruption. I'm Steve Porter, NBC News. Now, once again, here's Bob Trumpy. Thank you, and welcome back to Sports Talk. Just after 7 o'clock, our guest is Reuben Katz, a noted sports attorney. I repeat what I said in the first hour. No phone calls, please. While Reuben is here, we want to speak to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the job of being a sports lawyer. And, but we don't want in questions pertaining to Johnny Bench and Pete Rose's uh, upcoming uh, negotiations or current negotiations or how soon it's going to be before they sign. Uh, Ruben, if I'm not mistaken, uh, is uh, have you ever had a client who has been faced with free agency other than Pete Rose? I don't know. Sure. Uh, sure. Did, Tony, did, Tony Perez. And left? Uh, yes. He was traded. Uh, no. Tony left uh, Montreal and uh, went Oh, yeah. To went Boston. to Boston. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. Uh, when you began as a sports lawyer in the uh, late 60s and early 70s, and when uh, Peter Seitz ruled that uh, you can, in fact, become a free agent, that the option is not a perpetual option, therefore the reserve clause, gone. Did you ever expect that you would be negotiating a contract by uh, what you just said in the neighborhood of $800,000 a year for one human being? No. For an extended period of time? No, I I was uh, very surprised by what happened and by the uh, surprise by the generosity of the uh, owners of the baseball clubs. And are you also surprised that uh, barely four years later, eight hundred thousand dollars is a mere pittance now for professional athletes, professional baseball players? Two million dollars a year is now the standard. Well, it's still not a pittance. <laughs> Eight hundred thousand is still not a pittance, Bob. But uh, I guess I'm I'm somewhat surprised, but not totally surprised. And and it, I wouldn't be shocked if three years from now or four years from now the uh, appropriate player um, an appropriate player might make four million, five million. Are you serious? Why? You Why see not? it going that way? Well, I uh, they all could be down too. Uh, uh, that's not likely, but but it could. But sure, something uh, could happen. I I did not expect uh, the eight hundred thousand. Uh, I I know at one point someone suggested that uh, Pete might be able to get a million dollars a year, and two general managers that I know of uh, said that was idiotic. He'd be l likely to be lucky to sign for. Two or three hundred thousand dollars. So, uh, the judgment as to where these dollars uh, are and what the limit is, I think it depends on the particular player, the particular circumstance at the time, and uh, uh, just what's going on in the economy in general. All taken into account. Now, if I may, sir, in the last week on this program, and certainly in the paper, there's been an awful lot of uh, conversation uh, about uh, the. Uh, the dilemma with one Fernando Valenzuela, a second-year player who has the gall to ask for $800,000 a year, down from a million dollars a year after having made 42-5 last season. His uh, representative, Mr. Tony DeMarco, has stated uh, he's not going for less than 800000 Can you, in your mind as a sports attorney, 
can you uh, agree with that figure? Uh, do you think that that's exorbitant? Do you look at other contracts and say that's too much for that guy? Uh, how do you read that situation? I can't really comment on that. Uh, under all the circumstances, I don't know. I I can't say that eight hundred thousand is unreasonable for him. Um, it's it sounds like a heck of a lot of money, and when you say he's a second year player only, how can he get that much? Uh, I guess my comment would be is that I I would sympathize somewhat with management uh, because of the inability to reduce a salary. If uh, if it turns out he his first year was somewhat of a flash and maybe he doesn't produce well for a few years and then builds back up, I understand their point of view, but I understand his point of view too. Uh, if a pitcher particularly has a very precarious profession and if he hurts his arm this year, this may be his last shot at a big contract and if you just look at it in terms of contribution to the club and fan appeal, he's worth it. Oh, he's got if, it. If you look at it in terms of the long pull and that a person ought to have to work himself up, then maybe uh, he isn't. If you look at it from management's point of view, then you have to think about what is it going to do to the other players because uh, Los Angeles is not a team full of high, very high-priced players. Uh, they, um, their figures, are, they, I don't think they have a single one of the, uh, I don't think they have a player who earns over a million dollars. And there are very, very few teams that uh, are as successful as Los Angeles that can say that. If, if you had a situation with a player like that, and I don't know that you ever have, uh, would you, have you ever had a player sit out? In lieu of well, a contract? <clears throat> when I were, was act, I've never had uh, a player who was actively, uh, uh, who I actively represented in negotiations who sat out. As a matter of fact, and I wish I could remember the exact year, but one year Pete had a terrible, terrible year for Pete Rose. He batted 284. He led the league in games played because he played every game, and I think he, le he led the league in doubles. But he only batted 284, and the management said, we are going to cut your pay. Now, someone who, who uh, does that today uh, gets a $300,000 raise or something like that. Mm -hmm. But we thought about that for a long time. We didn't think it was uh, justified, but his alternative was to sit out. And certain people are not capable of doing that and Pete Rose was not capable of doing that but and the only alternative in those days was to hold out or play uh, at what the management wanted to offer so uh, I was through that experience we considered <clears throat> we considered all the factors and and Pete finally, um, and we talked it over, and Pete decided he would he would go show him, and he'd take his cut, and he'd go play. And the maximum cut nowadays in professional baseball is 20%, correct? Uh, that's right. If uh, Fernando Valenzuela signs a contract tomorrow for $800,000, goes 0 and 26, the minimum amount he can make next year would be $640,000. That's right. And then he would be subject to arbitration. That's right. Reuven, the pendulum has swung too far towards the player. Well, they don't have to pay him, though. They're not paying him. They said they're not going to. Yeah, they don't have to pay him, but they, they have They don't a... have to pay him. And he can sit out if he wants to, and they can go through the same thing again next year. It's only, as, I, as far as I know, it's only happened once in the history of baseball. And who was that? It was a center fielder for the Cincinnati Reds. And I can't remember his name right now. How long but ago? But I'm sure you have a lot of... Uh, People out there who... Uh, who will no. remember that. But he sat out a whole year. It was uh, before my time. He's an old-timer, and he did Oh, that. oh uh, uh, Eddie Roush? No. Not Eddie Roush? I don't think Eddie so. Collins? No. No, I, I, no. Are you sure it wasn't Eddie Roush? Might have been. Uh, I can't as remember. a matter of fact, he came to Cincinnati after sitting out a year. It was just in the paper the other day, uh, Van Harmon. Anyway. It's happened once. But, Reuben, I repeat, do you not agree to a certain extent that the pendulum has swung too far in favor of the players? No, I do not agree. With uh, 
Gary Car- uh, with uh, Dave Winfield signing a 10-year contract for $25 million. That's not excessive. It's not... And, and, uh, and I realize nobody put a gun to George Steinbrenner's right. head. That's right. But still... If uh, George Steinbrenner wants to pay that to Dave Winfield, why, why can't he do it? Then why do we hear past negotiations and collective bargaining... The commissioner of baseball, who by his own admission has stated that he does not speak for baseball, uh, and Harvard professors uh, educated in uh, business and business law and economics and marketing and all the rest of that stuff say that baseball is going broke. Where do they are they do they have a printing press somewhere? I, how can they come up with that kind of money? Doesn't they that do. bother you? They do. Ev- they do every year. Doesn't that bother you though? What what should bother me? I would think that anybody who is in the business, and I'm sure this is true of you. Uh, who represents a baseball player in contract negotiations must first of all first of all be concerned about the game of baseball sure. that if there is money there I want my share but if there is no money there there's no share well of course but uh, there does not seem to be the least bit of problem I I think we have some pretty smart businessmen here in Cincinnati and they run a company called Taft Broadcasting and Taft decided that, uh, apparently, that there was a, a good business future to baseball. And they just bought about half of the Philadelphia Phils for, I think, a record price. Now, they know a lot more about the management of baseball. They know a lot more about the present and future financial picture of the sport than I do or ever will. And they made that decision. And there are apparently a lot of good businessmen are, that are making the decision to get into baseball. Look at all the big companies I agree. that are going I, in there. I couldn't they're agree not, with you more. And they're, they're public companies, and their earnings are important to them. And they have stockholders and, to answer to. And they are not doing this because they're jocks or because of the glamour of the thing. They're putting a lot of bucks into this thing. And... I just have to believe that the money is there. And I'm sure, too, in the, in the contract you, negotiations you have for some of your clients in professional baseball, um, when you're speaking of uh, contracts in excess of a million dollars a year, aren't you somewhat privy to the information inside baseball as to where the next mother load is going to be? We here in the media think it's going to be uh, cable television. Surely, when you uh, when the Philadelphia Phillies could be talking about, and I believe the people in Philadelphia have already uh, um, stated that uh, they're very close. They certainly want to sign Pete Rose to a contract and make sure he's there come 1984 when he breaks uh, Ty Cobb's record. They've got to be looking at some way to make money to absorb the cost of that contract. Do they feel that the next mother load for uh, money in professional baseball is uh, cable television, or where is it coming from? I don't know. That That's really not my business, and uh, I, I try and keep up on it, and I read the same things you do, and maybe a few more things, but sure, that's one of the possibilities, and it's one of the obvious things that's uh, that's that they're thinking about is some sort of pay TV. And you don't believe that players and their salary demands and their long-term contracts are on the verge of breaking the bank of professional baseball? Uh, Taft Broadcasting doesn't. Levi Strauss doesn't think so. The Chicago Tribune doesn't think so. And I have to believe that they're pretty smart businessmen. They know the facts and the figures. I don't. And I have to believe they know what they're doing and that there's a good economic investment in professional sports, and particularly baseball, which we're talking about now. Mm -hmm. You've been a sports lawyer now for... uh, Can I interrupt you just just a minute? You keep saying I'm a sports lawyer, which um, at at part-time is true. It is about 10 or 15 percent of my practice of law. I do a lot of other things, so I am a lawyer who does some sports law. Okay. Uh, I wondered how I should address you. Now you straighten me out. Wait a minute, we just got handed a note here from uh, Doug Kidd. Eddie Roush did sit out with the Reds until August, traded to the New York Giants, but didn't sign. Sat out another year and played with New York, then came back to the Reds a couple of seasons later. Probably Bill G. called with that information. It wasn't Bill G. Question for you. You've now been a a lawyer with uh, some sports clients for uh, 14 years, 15 years? About that. Do you expect in the near future to to take on some other clients in the world of professional sports, or are you finished with these three? 
I I think I probably would uh, would not uh, take on any more representation of athletes uh, unless some special circumstance came along. I know at one point uh, a young man by the name of Petey Rose heard me say that, and he looked up at me. This was a few years ago, and he looked up and said, Oh, Reuven, when I become a major league player, won't you represent me? And I said, Well, <laughs> even if I'm in retirement, Petey, I'll, I'll come out and I'll do that. We do have uh, some young men in our office who would like to get into that. And if the opportunity came along, uh, I would be happy to help them represent some players, because I do feel a responsibility. First of all, I love sports, uh, and I, I do feel a responsibility toward upgrading all aspects of sports, and if I can do something in the uh, field of sports representation, I'd be very happy to do that. Uh, this seminar you talked about in, uh, in Fort Lauderdale coming up next week um, is run by the Sports Lawyers Association, and it's an attempt to get lawyers in all aspects of sports. Uh, we hope management lawyers and uh, players uh, lawyers and people involved in broadcasting, etc., will will come to this. Um, I've agreed to. Uh, I'm on the board of that association, and I and I hope that uh, in some small way I can contribute to the development of a sports bar. Uh, that that will help players, then they need the help, and um, and will do something uh, to further uh, sports representation. Would you? Would it? Is this a profession that you would uh, encourage young men to go into? I mean, I see along with uh, your name in lights and uh, well known. Uh, because it's only ten or fifteen percent of your practice, there are other guys uh, like Tom Rich, who's uh, sole job it is to uh, babysit, hold hands, advise, uh, leave wake-up calls for, pick up at the airport, uh, all sorts of sundry things that are certainly, I would think, beneath an awful lot of lawyers when you have to deal with a professional athlete. Uh, well, I don't know if, if I don't know if Tom does that. Um, I I do know I that um, what what I've developed is a very close um, working relationship with uh, the players, particularly um, Johnny, who lives across the street, and, uh, and Pete. Um, and I get involved in a lot of things. It's really sort of like being involved with... Uh, uh, it's more of a father-son relationship sometimes. And, and, and there are tremendous demands upon them the people who meaning the players meaning on the players, the players yes. right there's tremendous demands upon their time uh, there are so, even well-meaning people and some not so well-meaning who would like to get at them and use them or use their finances uh, it um, and very persuasive people and and it's a very demanding representation that's one of the reasons that i decided that i didn't want to spend more than ten or fifteen or twenty percent of my time doing it um, it's uh... it's it's not easy and and it's something that uh... i i have difficulty i have difficulty seeing how someone can really do it and represent uh... fifty or sixty or eighty people unless uh, they're being represented in a limited capacity, like contract negotiation mm -hmm. or something like that. Mm -hmm. Most, an awful lot of what you have to do is when something bad is stated about one of your uh, clients, is that you have to, uh, you got to fight off the press, you got to fight off sports talk show hosts and media people. Uh, well, show I, the other side. I don't really have to do that because it's not my my job to be a public relations person. If in fact I do that sometime. It's uh, that's that's more of the father-son uh, aspect of it than the lawyer-client aspect of it. Ruben, I still think though that 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 this generation of player in professional sports, and I include all professional sports because I believe with the new contract that that the NFL is about to sign with the three major networks, uh, almost doubling their ante per team per year that they're going to get from the networks, that we are. We are experiencing a group of athletes who become more and more isolated away from society because of the money that they make. 
less and less responsive to the people around the game that support the game, more and more intrigued with uh, what the other guy playing my same position makes, and more and more callousness inside the game. Did, are you talking about baseball only, or are you talking about No, I'm sports? really talking about sports in general. Do you find that's true in, in football? Because you know, you, yes. you've watched football a lot more. Yes, I do. I, I find... Uh, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. You don't find that in professional baseball uh, compared to 1968? I don't now? find it. I, I find the players... Uh, I, I, I see very little difference. When I go down to spring training and I do this for several days, just several days in the spring. And I go down there, bef I like to go down before the games start because I like to go out to the practice fields uh, where you see the guys working out and you see the, the guys standing around the batting cage and kidding with each other and they're out, they're working hard and they're out there running laps and, and they, they're like other people, they, some of them try and get out of that but they work hard, and, and you see they're just they're a bunch of young athletes uh, who, are, who want to do well. Now, there are exceptions to that, of course, but basically I don't see a lot of difference between the guys that are out there uh, working in, the, in that wonderful Florida sun <laughs> this time of year uh, today than, than what I saw 10 years ago or more when they were working just as hard and uh, trying to make the team and, and trying to do well. But doesn't it upset you at times when you read in the press where uh, Bake McBride, who was traded from Philadelphia to Cleveland, suddenly takes the stance of one Steve Carlton and doesn't talk to the press and will not doesn't want to be interviewed, uh, doesn't want his picture taken, doesn't want anything. There are, it seems to me, each year there are more and more... Look at Dave Parker. Uh, Bob, do you, you go down to Tampa yes, uh, I do. each year. Do you have trouble interviewing players? Uh, some I do, some I don't. And I'm sure that uh, Earl Lawson, and I think about when Earl's been around in baseball as long as anyone in in the in Cincinnati, uh, he'll tell you, well, Earl Lawson had trouble with uh, old-time players. Uh, I think he got in a, in a fight with one or two, if I if I rem uh, remember uh, you're correctly. Right. You're right. And uh, he had trouble getting interviews with some players and also uh, was very happy. And a lot of players are upset because no one comes around to interview them. And that went on back in the uh, 20s and the 30s and the 40s and the 50s and 60s and 70s, and it's going on now in the 80s. But there is something to gain directly, I believe, uh, to be being on Bob Trumpy Sports Talk Show or talking to Earl Lawson, who's a writer for The Post, or Tim Sullivan for The Inquirer. The more known you are in the community, uh, the more likely you are to uh, get some extraneous dollars outside no. of professional baseball. That's a big exaggeration, Bob. There is very little money outside of baseball for baseball players and professional athletes. Uh, occasionally there's an appearance here or there. There are very few athletes who do the commercials that Pete Rose and Johnny Bench uh, do, that, um, that Reggie Jackson does. There are a handful of players who do that. The great bulk of players have pr almost no outside income. I'll and they're not going to have a lot of outside income just because they talk to the press. No, I'll grant you that, but uh, as, is, as is the case, I believe, with Chris Collinsworth of the Cincinnati Bengals. Uh, he has that charisma. That's and right. And without the press there to relate that charisma to the paying public, nobody knows about Chris That's Collinsworth right. other than he wears 80 and catches passes. That's right. Chris, Chris apparently is... Uh, uh, obviously, he's, one he's of those very people. good. He's very good, and he seems to talk to the press. Do you ever have ever have any trouble talking with him? None, right? None whatsoever. But then, at the same time, there are people. I, I repeat, I think there is some direct gain talking to me, talking to our program, programs like us, Joe Garagiola, Tony Kubek, people of that nature. The more your name is spread around the country, the better known you become. The more chance you have for a pantyhose commercial. No. Not so. There are, there are just a tiny handful of athletes. It's one of the problems uh, that uh, people representing athletes face. They, a, a player thinks because he wins a title or wins an award that he is going to sit back and wait for all these wonderful offers to come in. Let me tell you, Mike Schmidt 
has had very few offers come in to him, and he's had these MVPs. Uh, it doesn't happen that way. There, you get a lot of calls, but mostly there are people who want to use you. There are very few who get those commercials. And to do interviews, the, the reason that I think it's important for athletes to do interviews and to cooperate with the press is because it helps their sport. And, and it helps the attendance, and it informs the fans of what's going on. That's the important part of doing that, not the personal gain, because there's very little personal gain from, from doing that. I don't know if you can answer this, uh, but in your estimation, with the stats that we saw in the paper this morning, where it's simply offensive stats, what on the very, very bottom line determines a player's salary nowadays in professional baseball. Not football or hockey or basketball, but on the bottom line, the very, very bottom line, what's the determining factor to make a, a player worth a million dollars a year? Well, there are a lot of factors. Uh, one the biggest? Is, well, the biggest is his need, the, how badly the team needs him. Uh, to not only play baseball, but also draw people to the stands? Well, whatever. Uh, you know, both. Some Some draw people to the stands and aren't terribly good. Some are outstanding and don't draw a lot of people to the stands. And the ones who get the most are the ones who do both well. But it And it's the particular need of the team at the time. But unfortunately, do you, unfortunately, do you find agents, uh, people who represent professional baseball players who just travel the country and say, look, this guy made X amount of dollars, my guy's better, I want X plus 10 and take very nothing else into account except uh, this other guy made that much. Why can't my guy? Well, the, just because you ask doesn't mean that you're going to get. And if he's asking for an unreasonable amount, he's not going to get it. Just because an, an agent comes in and says, I want so many dollars, doesn't mean he's going to get it. Reuben, I said last night, though, and I believe this, we who are baseball watchers, sports talk show hosts, People in the media, writers, journalists, fans, must forever wipe from our minds or from our speech pattern the phrase, that's too much. There doesn't appear to be a figure that is too much now for, for, for professional baseball. Anything is possible. Anything. Anything is possible in anything in free enterprise. Ruben Katz is our guest. We can't keep him much longer. The program is Sports Talk. Uh, we'll be back after these important messages. Sports Talk on WLW with Ruben Katz. Uh, sports, uh, he is an attorney who has some uh, clients who happen to play professional sports, mainly Tony Perez, Pete Rose, and Johnny Bench. And I don't want to talk about those three contracts, but uh, what is off the wire apparently is that uh, Rose is uh, close to signing a contract or at least... Uh, past the early stages of negotiation. What's the situation with Tony Perez, Ruben? Well, Tony has uh, his final year of his contract with Boston, and they have another y an option on another year. And uh, when you reach that age in baseball, uh, as with Pete and uh, Tony, uh, you pretty much take each year at a time and see what happens. They keep going, and they keep doing well. And you just play it one year at a time. Mm-hmm. Uh, I understand off the wire that the contract that uh, that Mr. Rose might eventually sign is for four years. And the other night here on the program, Ruben, he's stating that I'm not ready to give up. In four years, I'll still be playing 162 games a year. That is, if he gets over his back problem. I, I, you agree? Well, I don't know whether he will or not. And he likes to talk that way because when you talk optimistically, you feel better about it. And I don't think uh, too many people thought three years ago when he signed his first contract with the Phils that he'd be looking to sign another contract. I have no idea how long he'll continue to play. I know that he did very well last year. He almost won the batting championship. He led the league in hits. Uh, he led uh, the league in a lot of cat in several categories, and he played uh, very uh, good, according to uh, people in Philadelphia, very good defensive first base. So. I don't see any any problem yet. And he so also paid for himself. I don't know himself. how long he'll go on. And he also paid for himself. No question about it. The Philadelphia people say that uh, Pete is a big bargain to them. 
Well, uh, i got to get you home before Catherine gets mad at me. I hope so. Uh, <laughs> I still wonder if in the near future, if there might be uh, some of those uh, less than admirable agents uh, scouring high school ranks and grade school ranks for possible players and signing them up with uh, the hope that in uh, five or six or ten years that there is uh, a $5 million a year athlete sitting there. And it seems to me that... Uh, Maybe I'm speaking exception rather than the rule. That professional athletes have really lost touch with uh, the rest of the world. You keep saying Yes, that. I do. And I, maybe it's because I'm now on the other side. I, f I find fewer and fewer solid citizens in professional sports than I did when I first came in. And I'm not kidding you. Well, I'm, I've been amazed... Uh at how little difference there has been, and and if you see it differently, uh, you know that's right. fine. I, I look at I, it my my principal experience is with baseball. Yeah, and, those three players. And if there's been a change in uh, in football, let me tell you uh, one other thing. I I was describing uh, what a uh, person who uh, is an attorney and represents uh, athletes does. Uh, uh, an attorney may not go out and solicit business. Uh, he can be disbarred for doing that. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, one of the things you'll find is that uh, the, the, so those out soliciting these high school kids uh, are the non-attorneys that are doing it. There's one other point I wanted to make. I, I've heard a lot of people say, why does, a, why does a baseball player need someone to represent him? Can't he go in and do his own contract like Bob Trumpy did all those years? Fool. Uh, well, I don't know whether you, you know, each person... I was to, happy. Each, right. Each, each one uh, does what he thinks is best for himself, and I think that's great. But, and maybe when you were talking about a, a basic contract, and, and in the old days, uh, a per, it was fair for a player to negotiate for himself because there wasn't much he could do anyway, mm -hmm, and there wasn't right. much that uh, a, a representative could do. But when you're talking about contracts... Uh, in the hundreds of thousands and the millions of dollars, uh, there are, and there are no or very few businessmen who will not seek aid when they are negotiating that sort of a contract, and and just because it's a salary uh, with a or other compensation with a with a baseball club, uh, doesn't mean that it doesn't require some expertise. And I just go back to the simple statement, a baseball player who today with, with longer-term contracts, a baseball player negotiates a contract at most once a year, more likely every three to six years. And the man on the other side of the table negotiates those contracts uh, many times every year. And that's his business. And that's why athletes need representation. Mm -hmm. I'll grant you now with uh, the kind of money you're speaking of. Final point, and I don't mean to harp on this point, but to uh, maybe uh, put some evidence or some support to what I say about the different generation of athletes. Um, I don't think it's any secret that back in 1968, uh, if you had an athlete who was making uh, 60 or uh, uh, football player who was making 60 or 70 thousand dollars per year. And a baseball player who was making $100,000 per year, he was very, very well paid. But that $50,000 for a football player, $100,000 for a baseball player, was not enough money to carry him for the rest of his life. I tend to think nowadays, Reuben, with a, with a contract at a superstar in professional sports, let's say Gary Carter, $15 million over eight years, Dave Winfield, $25 million over ten years, George Foster, $10 million over five years, we are producing a class of people nowadays through these current negotiations more often in professional baseball but also included in professional basketball that with uh, an IQ of 26 and a smart man who at least knows where you can find CDs that will pay him 10 or 12 or 13 percent he will never have to lift a finger towards any venture any monetary endeavor for the rest of his life he can sit comfortably and live off the interest of that money. And I'm not sure that that's healthy for any person to be in, to be uh, a prince or a dictator from age 37 or 40 to the end of his life. 
I'm not sure that's healthy. I'm talking about solid citizens. Well, there. Are, I, I don't know how to answer that. I, I don't. I don't think you're asking a question. Mm -hmm. You're making a statement again. And I don't know whether I agree or disagree with that. But there are a lot of solid solid citizens who haven't had to lift a finger. Uh, I think, uh, for example, of the Rockefellers. Somebody did, though. Uh, the Rockefellers. Uh, they um, they got out and worked, even though they were uh, multimillionaires and, and contributed a great deal, and still are, in the uh, political, uh, banking, and, and other areas in that one family. Would but you expect that, though, out of, uh, I'll give you a choice of uh, 500 baseball players, would you expect any of those to possibly become the governor of the state of New York? Would you have um, said, uh, we'll look at some movie stars, and Ronald someday Reagan, yes. one might be president of the United States? No, I, you yeah. got me there. I will we'll grant you, no, I never would have expected that. Uh, Steve Garvey is uh, talking about uh, someday, he, uh, I, I've read, uh, said he someday he, he would like to run for senator. Jack Kemp and Bill Bradley are sure. well on their way sure. towards the presidency. Okay, you just answered yourself. I guess so. Now what? Well, maybe my... Um Bob, it, it goes down to the individual. Uh, I've been blessed with uh, representing um, three, three fellows who are intelligent, uh, know where they're going, uh, work hard, and uh, I think will contribute in, in different ways in the future. Uh, they all talk about the future and what they're going to do, even though hopefully uh, they will have enough to retire on when they they finish playing baseball. Retire on? Enough to retire on? Hopefully they will have enough. Reuben, that's, I mean, even accounting for inflation. One million dollar a year contract. Well, I don't represent anyone who has a one million dollar a year contract. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Uh, I wonder who that might be. Anyway, Reuben, i got to get you home before Catherine gets mad. Thank you very much for coming over. It's been a pleasure. Appreciate being your comments. Here. Enjoy talking with you and listening to you. Okay. <laughs> Reuben Katz, attorney who represents uh, sports figures, broadcast figures, and, uh, and uh, humble figures, I suppose. This is Sports Talk on WLW. It's now 15 minutes before 8. We're here tonight until 9.30. Now your phone calls. Now that the... Uh, the uh, representative of these uh, gentlemen are are uh, is gone, and we'll be back to talk to you after these important messages.